woke up this morning to seven inches of snow. Ah, going live. Hey everyone, welcome back from the break. I hope you fueled up. Um, we're going straight back into the fray with another pillar pillar of the SEO community, Mr. Dan Taylor. Dan is the edgy expert of edge CA CDNs. He's the winner of, in of the inaugural Tech SEO Boost Research Prize, and he's consulted for Cloudflare, GitLab, Proton, and many others. Dan's a regular speaker at Brighton SEO, if you know that one, Tech SEO Boost, and Optimization, which is held in Moscow. Anyone listening in the SaaS or enterprise space is going to be extremely well served by listening to this talk, where Dan is going to walk us through the methods you need to build a mega content hub. The same methods that he's used to build a 1 million organic sessions per month SEO moat for a large SaaS company. So Dan, everyone has been waiting for this one in anticipation. Thanks for being here and it's over to you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Marina. I hope I can live up to the, uh, the introduction. So let me just share my screen and my slides. So hello everyone, um, I hope everyone is enjoying day two thus far. Uh, as Larry has alluded to, my name is Dan Taylor, I'm going to be talking about building mega 1 million session content hubs and kind of the methodologies behind that. So as Larry's already given me a great introduction, there's not really much else I can add to that. Um, apart from I'm just in general an SEO nerd, an SEO speaker and importantly a cat dad. Um, she would not pose with me for a photo, so there was a photo of me with a turtle instead. Outside of that, I'm head of R&D at Salt, so I spend, I, well, I, I'm fortunate I get to spend a lot of my days basically playing around and breaking things, which is great because inside I'm just a giant child and it means I get to test new things, test new technologies and just constantly be having that kind of fun. Well, I call it fun. Um, so... Today, I'm going to cover over very quickly what a content hub is. I'm not going to go into too much detail and dwell on that because I'm sure we're all well versed now, uh, we're all well versed in what they are. Uh, I'm going to go over how a content hub can fit into your website architecture and also, importantly, how your client or your business works as a funnel and actually generates leads and sales. I'm going to go over my process of how I do the research planning and then prioritization, and I'm going to use an example. Um, of just a random product which I've been looking at a lot recently and how I would go about building a, a top level hub there. Also touch upon the stakeholder involvement and contribution and then just kind of also in this whole process touch on how you want to look at the ongoing maintenance side of things because when we talk about large pieces of content we all oftentimes just think about the resource element of it and we know that producing anything evergreen will require maintenance, will require pruning just the general kind of upkeep that we were saying but how we can potentially look about in different ways so won't be an seo talk about starting off with a graph so here is the graph i took this from my third party tool uh the website in question was live since 2012 but i've cut that part out of the graph but the essentially the hub we launched towards the end of 2017 and it peaked around about a year ago in terms of traffic the reason for the drop, which I'm actually going to talk about because I also feel it's important that as an SEO we talk about why the traffic decreased. Simply put, they removed all the internal linking for the hub from their top of navigation and that correlated with a large drop in the actual organic traffic being received. So that's the reason why that cliff face happened. One other thing I want to touch on with this is content hubs like this aren't necessarily quick wins they require an element of research they require resource in producing the content through prioritization and as that graph kind of demonstrated above it also requires time google doesn't take these hubs straight away and rank them on page one it likes to do a lot of testing with edge queries it likes to do testing with the big search volume marquee keywords it does take time for Google to process. This time will vary depending on the different industries, but it is a key thing to put in play because I see a lot of people do these hubs. They push the boat out and because they're not sailing at full speed and doing a good dotage straight away, they lose kind of faith in the tactic and in the acquisition element. So touching on what a content hub actually is, 
a content hub goes by a number of different names and in our industry has gone by a number of different diagrams. These are the three I see probably more common, the kind of a bubbly diagram around talk topics, secondary topics and how they overlap. There's the pillar and cluster element, which is also known as hub and spoke, um, web content, content network, and then there's my one I prefer to use, which is actually just more of a straightforward hierarchical diagram because it's nice and shows architecture and we can show linking elements. Ultimately, though, regardless of what the name of the moat, the hub, the silo, the pillar, the spokes, the cluster, whatever you want to call it, the objectives are the same. We want to acquire users and we want to acquire traffic. I differentiate between the two because for me, users are more qualified than just generic traffic. Traffic is your visibility. Users are the qualified people you want to educate and move down the funnel. We want to build out this content to represent an each element. We want to show that we, by producing this heavy resource, our clear expertise in this field, we have got a lot of authority and you should trust us with this content. And that can help and has through what we've seen in rankings for just related queries, go to some way in helping build that. We also want to create relevant internal linking hubs. Now, again, when we build out either a centralized or decentralized web architecture, we want to make sure we get all the commercial keywords, maps, all the, non all the uh, informational, all the navigational, transactionals, but we want to make sure we get some good internal linking moving. And oftentimes getting those anchor texts isn't easy or natural on the site. Producing giant content hubs like this enables you to get that nice link flow and anchor text link flow happening through the site relatively easily. And then also there's the element that these, these resources do acquire backlinks if they're good enough and authoritative enough over time. And backlinks are never a bad thing to work naturally. So we're going to look at how to incorporate this into the site. And really the objective kind of matches the placement when we think about the hub we also have to think about the website architecture for cms's different elements how we're actually going to apply this oftentimes and more often than not being honest i recommend this is separate from the blog however it doesn't necessarily have to be the same templates you can uh, map a additional WordPress install to a subfolder. You can even map one to a subdomain if you really wanted to. I have seen subdomains work extremely well in this instance, if implemented correctly and internal linked correctly. Um, even if you want to use a different CMS because content accessibility again, security elements, or whether or not your actual core CMS has the capabilities to achieve this. You then want to also think about how this is going to fit in into your sales architecture because Again, whilst this can produce a lot of traffic, you want it to produce users, and the users need to be qualified. So this content is typically more associated with Tofu and Mofu, so Tofu top of funnel users and Mofu middle of funnel users. So we can speak the sales language and say it's that top visibility education level pieces. And then understanding what the motivation of those users are it depends also where we can potentially place this on the site in our URL architectures, in our information architectures, and how we map all that together. So the other thing important to say is there is more than one type of content hub, and it's important early on to decide the one which we're going to build and then stick with it because we don't want to cross the street and quote Ghostbusters in that sense. So the three hub types, the informational content hub, which is the one I'm going to focus on in this conversation today because it's for me the less independent on internal business knowledge and client specific and it's a general practice you can effectively roll out across multiple clients and people and that essentially is focused on subject matter expertise but importantly is void of heavy sales and product messaging because again going back to that point about the motivation of these users they're often going to be researching, we're going to be looking for information and guides. It's about understanding that time to sell and the time to be commercial and how that can disrupt a user journey and even turn them off from wanting to proceed with a company and brand. The second kind of hub is a project knowledge base. Um, 
And a good example of this is the knowledge base that Atlassian produced a couple of years ago. And this essentially is a conversation I have with a lot of companies, especially in the SaaS tech, um, even fashion and retail spaces, where if someone has a question about your product or a specific use case or how to use something, who do you want to rank? Who do you want to give that information? Do you want it to be you where you can control that conversation, specifically around SaaS and integration products? Or do you want it to be someone with an opinion on Stack Overflow or Quora? And that can lead to misinformation. It can lead to misforecasting. And then the user could potentially just be left dissatisfied with your product or just get the wrong information. And again, it's the internet. People will influence places that rank with information for their own need. And then the final one is an optimized support center. So optimized support centers for me are very good again. It's a it's an extension of a product knowledge base. And again, it's the taking of going to all your sales development representatives, all your custom success teams, take all their weird edge questions and edge queries and everything which could be answered in 25 to 50 words potentially and just create support articles and your support base for it and really optimize your support center as a content hub again own your own brand space own your own space and don't be afraid to address issues faults and other use case issues in this area because again the more educated you can make a user and the more you can control that conversation the less chance for raise that they'll probably engage with your product, realise it doesn't meet their new case, and then churn. So that's low LTV, high cost per acquisition, and just high churn rates, which will affect your MMR and AIR statistics. So when we look at the website architecture again, the decision of where you're going to put these hubs is going to pretty much be led by your existing stack and processes. Um, typically, it'll be a subfolder on the domain, Depending on what you're currently running, you might reverse proxy WordPress, reverse proxy Ghost, any other CMS system in there, a nice front end. Um, you might even run something headless um, like an X on the WordPress and just have it run there. Um, if you really were stuck, you could run it on a subdomain. They can work effectively and do work effectively. Um, but it, obviously, there's a the subfolder subdomain debate which there's only 32 minutes left of this talk. I don't think I can even scratch the surface on that monstrosity. Um, and then my only other point is it should definitely be separate from a blog. It's a different content type and we want it to be a special resource area and not bundled in with the five big five contents, your comparison pieces, your company news. It wants to have that separate area. It wants that separate piece of information architecture. In my opinion, I almost treat it like a microsite within the site itself. It needs someone to have special treatment. So the challenge is essentially in being this open in the content and open in the business that I basically get a lot. These will probably be challenges and friction points that you find when you're trying to sell this idea and with people as well and clients is a lot of the conversations and advice pieces you're going to be putting in these areas very traditional business models with very traditional sales models feel that the conversation is better had by them the conversation is better served by the sales team lots of traditional business models also see the sales process as being the place to do the education it's about creating the rapport and the trust and also the upsell cross sell area where your the user comes in doesn't 100 percent know what they want so you're doing that steering and that guidance and then they overvalue the human element in that process and the reason i say they overvalue the human element in that process is just anecdotally from experience and all from reading books other marketers have written have the same experience but roughly 70 percent of that buying decision and that buying process from users online is made before the prospect will actually engage with the company in question. So you're hedging your bets on not educating enough in that 70% before they even get in touch. So this is why the hub model creates that trust, creates the build. And obviously as users online as well, we open multiple tabs, we'll open multiple websites, 
our journeys, uh, sorry, our journeys are not linear. We will skip around, hop around, but we'll bookmark, we'll remember, and we'll start doing searches, and we'll start to go back to places that help educate us. And if that information is accurate, that helps build the trust much more than speaking to someone who has a motivation to sell to you. So now, now with that in mind and understanding the objective, I want to start talking about how we plan it and the data sources that we look for. So data sources, as you can imagine, you have Hrefs, et al, other tools available. And for me, these are an end process for if you need to pull through MSV data, um, some of the search volume data, any additional keywords, any wider scope. For me, those are an end step in the process. And personally speaking, from building out a lot of these hubs, depending on your niche, a lot of queries and terms you're going to be planning for will have low monthly search volumes. And the reason behind that isn't because people aren't looking, it's because A, your niche, and B, a lot of search volume data is influenced by paid search. Paid search is heavily influenced on conversion. So these aren't conversion phrases. So the data isn't going to stack up and move in that way. Other things to take into account here, are um, mainly not from a question and keyword perspective, but from seeing how Google is making connections between entities, use cases and perspectives is through the people also ask features. Uh, tools like Dragon Metrics um, can collate those as part of their own tracking process and standard. And you can also just write a Python script and scrape them as well. Second way of easily getting um, in, or basically how Google associates elements is through image entity tags. It's quick and easy to do just a search and scroll for images. You can also scrape them through Python. And this is also a little glimpse, in my opinion, into Mum, which replaced BERT last year from Google's kind of artificial intelligence and how it maps the relations between different entities together and how it creates that understanding. And then importantly, feedback loops from your SDRs and your general sales teams, customer success teams, anyone who actively is facing the customer at the call face just to create that value to get edge perspective edge use cases even the weird angles which we might not necessarily have thought of and the weird angles that definitely won't have come through keyword research tools or google so how do we begin so what what, what does this planning process look like so to do this i'm literally going to take a random topic uh for some reason this year i've decided this is the year i'm going to go into the wilderness um, probably watch too many YouTube videos on bushcraft and wild camping, but I've been researching a lot around hiking boots, trail boots, etc. So, what would we look at, and how? What would the process be to start reverse engineering what a hub architecture could be, based on what Google and what third-party tools are already kind of showing and pointing us in the direction of as to be information that users want to get and want to achieve from their research. So first of all, we can take a look at the people also ask boxes and we can go through them. We can scrape them, get all the questions. But then what we want to do really is start looking for themes and start looking for not necessarily keywords, but the different angles that are going on in here. So we know that people are starting to look for difference between walking and hiking. We're starting to look at the difference between product comparison. So we're already in the first two getting heavy product comparison elements and also that there are related and similar products which may have crossover. The fourth one down gives us an indication there might be three types of boots. And if that's the general information that Google's pulling through, that is potentially also the information users are getting fed and what early educated users will be receiving as well. So that's important because we want to create consistency with this content as well as it being accurate. A good example of this, I think, was in 2016, 2017, when Rand Fishkin, um, alma mater of Moz, did a Whiteboard Friday in which he focused on granola bars. And for me, I all the new execs we hire, I make watch that video because it goes to an extent of how whilst Google is machine learning, whilst it has the AI, whilst it can make the connections, 
it's only intelligent as the data we give it. And in this example with granola bars, he gives uh, that you have 10 product pages and nine of the 10 product pages talk about the ingredients, allergens, calories, protein, sugar, salt, etc. But on your product page, you don't. You don't display the information in a table like the others do. You talk about the flavours, textures and other elements as well. But the other pages do that also. So when Google, as a machine, looks at all this information, it identifies consistency. It can identify the, oh, so granola bars, good information, is talking about ingredients, allergens, etc. Why is this page not doing that when all the others are? And then that creates an anomaly in the cohort. And once you have an anomaly in the cohort, that's when the content either is distrusted or potentially doesn't have the same beneficial purpose as what the other content and other content produced does. And beneficial purpose is a concept in the quality rated guidelines, the same as EAT and needs met scales, but isn't talked about as much as EAT because ha saying content has a purpose is relatively, well, for that's the baseline, all content should have a purpose, but it's the beneficial purpose that Google focuses on and wants to apply directly to the main content on a page and supporting. So going back to the PAA examples, the next things we get are talking about everyday usage. So this is people necessarily talking just can or can it be used every day versus specific use types. So then we start breaking into use types, which again shows us the difference between trail and walking. And then we get the waterfall hike and muddy hike. So just from looking at the PAAs immediately, we have different application uses in walking, hiking, trail. We have different uh, scenario uses as well in terrain. So we're automatically getting an insight into the different elements that we probably need to address in this hub. The next thing we want to look at is image entity tags. And image entity tags essentially, for me, are a front end way of very quickly performing entity analysis across Google's understanding of specific topics. So this is a quote from a patent which um, I've listed the patent number in there if you want to really go through and look at it. But essentially, it talks about how Google does association scores and can produce a confidence level depending on the input. So if you've got photos of hiking routes on mountains, it can start to making the connection boot, mountain, rock, tree, boot, mountain, rock, tree, and detection within images. Within the patents itself, Google actually shows this as an example of bears. So with bears, we have bear, fish, water. We have bear, fish, water, bear, water, bear, fish, bear, water, ice, and bear, ground. So then from just these six images, Google can start to create relations and relationship trees on how different entities for bear, fish, water actually interact and based on the actions, i.e. the fish is in the mouth of a bear. So this is where we understand the grizzly bear has a relationship to fish, and then it can also have confidence on the infer that it eats it. Fish live in water, grizzly bears by water. And this is how Google goes around processing and focusing on images and transposing entities. We then do an image search, and we can actually start to see this ourselves. And at the top of image search itself, you will see that there are a number of tags and you can click on those tags and you can filter by them. Those filter names are almost related categories and related entities that Google understands are related to hiking boots and also has all the data of search behind it of us doing compound searches, us doing search stacking, which uh, search stacking for me is when we will Google um, one query, we'll read results, then we'll refine it and do further refinements until it eventually gets that end query. So we're automatically seeing in this, we're automatically understanding the information Google's getting and with images as well and the data that Google gets from it, for me this is also a very pure form of information and a pure form of basically Google's understanding of the internet because 10, 15 years ago, 
as SEOs, we focused on links. We focused on keyword density. We focused on written text. Images almost just became a aesthetic vehicle to make the page look nice, to encourage conversion, to shine things up a little bit. No one's ever really gone out of the way and gone, I want hiking boots to be associated more with muddy, wet terrains. Let's get more pictures out there. No, we've written content, we've done marketing, we've done PR. Images have just fallen naturally by use cases. And then from there, we can take use case data. And it's a lot, as I said, in my opinion, a lot more pure and untainted by SEOs and marketers. It's more reflective of the real world in that sense. So themes we can take from the emergency tags are that there's a heavy focus again on use case. So there's waterproofing, submergence, wet grip. There's elements around mud, mud distribution and aesthetic permanence. So by aesthetic permanence, I mean, if I really go through the world of muddy swamp and quagmire, will it basically make them look awful moving forwards or will they still look good for five years down the line? Then you've got the hiking versus trail versus uh, walking itself. You're then moving to synthetics versus leather versus Gore-Tex. And then other elements like breathability, comfort, temperature control. And then also your terrain mixtures as well. So we're getting all that from images. We can then back this up with keyword research because we've already got a prime data set. So we want to match the objective of Content Hub again. In this instance, it's informational. So we want to demonstrate that we're subject matter experts. We want to focus on questions. We also want to focus on perspectives and scenarios. So by perspectives, I mean, it's very easy to just write content based on questions. But in order to show expertise, show authorship, and also demonstrate authorship through author vectors, which we know Google uses to detect the writing styles of authors across different subject matters but we want the perspectives of this to show opinion we don't want it to be a blase here's some keywords on the page here's an answer of 500 words let's be lucky and we also want to focus on scenarios because that is what the end user is doing and the reason why we want to focus on the scenario is to at this top of funnel tofu middle of funnel mofu stage create better education and that builds the trust element. So if I'm researching of the best hiking boot for a British spring trail, I want to think about mud. I want to think about wet. I want to think about hills. So I want the context of the answer to match the scenarios which I'm going to be as the end user using the product in. Meaning that if then at the end of this piece or it links through to a blog post talking about the best uh, wet and mud hiking boots for 2020, I've got trust that these recommendations I'm going to receive directly linked to from this content in this blog post are going to have validity for my use case. So I can better forecast my experience of using the product, using the service. And if my forecasted experience matches the fulfillment of a product or service, I'm less likely to churn. I'm likely to continue a subscription. I'm likely to remain as a customer. I'm likely to, over time, increase my lifetime value and reduce my cost of acquisition. I'm also likely to engage in more content, share content, and almost develop an advocacy level. And with advocacy level, I'm going to bring more customers to the brand. I'm going to leave positive reviews. I'm going to almost become a self-fulfilling cog in the marketing wheel. So a good way of doing this in a modern way is to look at things like HRS parent topics. So if we look through there at top level, we can see that there's also concerns around the boot style and fashion. We want there's people also then looking at care, so the cleaning of, um, there's comfort elements around do they need to be a size bigger, what is the size toe room. So we can see there's different levels of education, different levels of research in these, and these hubs need to reflect this and almost be a one-stop shop for the informational content without the pressure to sell. So everyone, so for the basis of keywords for people like, we can also then start to plan the content types. 
so how to clean hiking boots well we know from looking at the information already that there's different types of content and um, also different types of hiking boots so we can have written a video content around how to clean synthetic how to clean uh leather how to clean split leather um how they should fit again we know there's different materials we know there's different boot shapes types with different uppers midsoles so we can tailor the content to there we become more user centric through this process and we can also then understand well do we need written content or do we need a video or do we need both how can we best accommodate the different users in this approach to how they're doing things if i'm wanting to learn how to lace a hiking boot i'm potentially going to want a video and i'm going to want it broken down i'm going to want step by step especially if it's complex knots similar to like what and the way you can look at that is to look at associated elements so look for connections in other areas so if, you, if someone's going hiking quite a lot have a look at the relationship between hiking and camping if people go camping a lot then they potentially will know and understand how to tie different knots have a look at the content and video that's produced around knot tying and take those demonstrable lessons and take and put them into a how to lace video because then you're not just communicating the answer to a question the user has but you're communicating the answer through a medium and a method they're already accustomed to so you're basically speaking their language and helping them onboard the information faster better helping them achieve their goal quicker and building trust in the process so once we've got all this information essentially what can we do we need to plan the hub and going back to again just doing a straight site map diagram we've created the hub so the hub for here is owning hiking boots so then we have the top three categories of choosing boot care and comfort so then through choosing we're going to talk about the application we're not going to talk about the bet the boot itself we're going to talk about the user focused end of it so the application are they going to be in snow are they going to be doing a lot of mountain and rugged terrain are they going to be doing trails is it going to be water this is the area where you can create sub areas and from here as a sub as almost like a category in itself and produce that content we also want to then talk on the components so we're going to talk about uppers we're going to talk about the midsoles we're going to talk about the internal supports all that's important because then it all when that section maps to the materials itself do we want leather do we want split grain do we want synthetic because if you're going to be going up into the snow or into very very low fahrenheit temperatures you probably don't want leather because leather gets most leather gets brittle at low temperatures so you'll probably want a synthetic you'll probably also want a different care grade on it depending on your application use all that information in there we can map it and use a fair way versus just targeting keywords that then relates to the waterproofing and durability because it's great if a shoe or the boot will last one turn but i'm not spending 80 to 100 dollars on something that will last once i want multiple uses out of it i want to know what my anticipated mileage out of this shoe will be if i take care of it what are the variables that will mean i can get longer out of it what will be the variables which mean it will deteriorate faster this is what i want to know that's where it leads in and can link into a boot care category now i've committed i know what my application is going to be that's predetermined i've now got an idea based on my body shape body height and general comfort level what i want the components to look like and the kind of style and then based on the application and that i also know the material i need i've also got a rough idea of how long that's going to last me now I'm going to look at the boot care elements. Do I want something which is relatively simple and easy to lace? Or am I going all in and I effectively need to purchase something which I need to look after in a high level? And the reason, so comparison to this is, for example, cigars. Cigars are relatively expensive to purchase as a initial product. But then you also need to purchase a humidor. You also then need to ensure and maintain that the humidor is at around 65% humidity. You're making an investment and a commitment and that investment and commitment isn't going to be for everybody so you need to make sure that differentiation is clear in the content hub again so the end user can better forecast your experience make the right product choice get good value out of that product choice then when that reaches end of life 
they're going to come straight back to you because you've already fulfilled what they want first time round, giving them good information and you've built the trust. Then from there, you want to move on to the comfort side. And this addresses the actual user focus things itself. And this is where there'll be no direct answer other than multiple verbals. But you want to then talk about the size buying guide for wide feet, flat feet, narrow feet, high and sole arch. And then even just a rough idea of how to break them in. Because a lot of time with retail products, and especially hiking boots, just from looking through the forums, people will go, well, how do I break in a pair of shoes? And there'll be a thousand opinions online. Your mother-in-law will have an old wives' tale trick that will do it, but actually ruins the shoe. And before you know it, you've destroyed a pair of $80 walking shoes. And that isn't the walking shoes' fault. That isn't the company's fault. But that's because you weren't given the education to do it properly. Again, if you can help them achieve full end of life and full maximum life with these, this helped us that. And then going back to that graph, this is the value, because if people keep clicking on this, you solid user engagement signals, this is where Google starts to rank this higher and higher over time. And that's what you can see through the graph, which I shared earlier. It didn't rank page one overnight. It took time. It took time for Google to trust it. As Google started trusting it more, as we started adding to it, as we maintained it and started looking at the additional questions, which users were coming through on, um, continuously reiterating. You're building out more use cases. So then you build up that trust with Google that this is actually the expertise element and that trust will come at different phases depending on how well established in the niche your brand already is and a plethora of other factors. But it actually creates that value element. Now, from a technical perspective, we could improve this even further. So... A lot of value to your site just outside of this hub itself comes from internal linking. So we want to create an internal linking strategy. So the internal linking strategy we essentially get from these, for me, has three objectives. We want to ultimately provide support and authority for the domain as an overall element, because let's be honest, the point of our website is to get sales and leads. We want to provide additional contextual relevancy for the top of funnel, middle of funnel terms. And we want to create that education piece which keeps people coming back and keeps people engaged. Because of this, we actually need to be careful about the internal linking structures and make sure that there's context and good elements around this. So with these, it's a key point that we need to keep the intents and perspectives unmixed, undiluted. It's very, very common in businesses that build these hubs and even get to 250, 500,000 traffic. They want to start putting CTAs in. They want to start the sales pitch early. It's the wrong time. And keeping that at bay and keeping them at the gates is key. So that's why with a good agreed linking strategy, we can make sure that we're linking through to commercial pages. So, for example, we we say we talk about oh, with a CDN solution. CDN solution is a commercial intent keyword. We're talk we've said the phrase CDN solution naturally within the content, so that makes a good anchor text to link through to the CDN commercial page. Not check out Brand X's CDN solution. It's jagged. It's unnatural. It breaks up the user intent. Breaks up the journey. We also want to be natural and put the links in at appropriate junctures in the content and not just shoehorning in random links higher up a page or big CTAs, etc., which, again, just tries to pick you back off the traffic for sales. And understanding the commercial transactional intent, we want to make sure that if we're linking through to commercial pages from these, we're using those commercial transactional navigational intent queries. So we're giving Google clear signals that here's some information and here's to go for commercial. And then a final, or the final points I wanted to cover, because I appreciate and push for time, is to look at templated linking. And that is essentially, we can make these work harder. So secondary navigation menus, localised to the hub templates, related content sections, linking through to key parts of the hub, internal body links between the hubs themselves. And another tactic which I found useful is creating a footer just for those hub templates, which acts as a pseudo HTML sitemap for that specific area in the hub, just to help boost internal linking. 
Um, so I want to say thank you for the 150 plus people who've been in attendance. And I think this is the first presentation I've ever done that's actually run to time. Um, so back over to Larry to host the Q&A. Sorry, fumbling around. Thanks so much for that. That was really, really great. Um, I really enjoyed that, uh, that, that, that chat, Dan. Um, and I think everyone got a lot of really practical um, uh, kind of strategies out of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly jump over to the uh, Q&A to see what we've got there. Um, so anyone who has any questions on what Dan's just been through, please, um, by all means, go and, uh, and, and ask him questions. Otherwise, Dan, what's the best way for people to kind of get any more information on on this? Have you got have you written stuff elsewhere? Um, have you got a blog somewhere people could go to as well? Um, um, yeah, sure, so, um, I've got a lot of content on my own site, uh, Dan Taylor uh, online, and then more content. Essentially, I publish a search in the journal. Um, it's quite a bit as well. Um, an article went live yesterday, I think it's actually on the internal linking side. So... Mm -hmm. Alternatively, happy people to engage with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and there's a lot of other, for me, good content out there reading around this. So, Kevin Indig has a good a lot of articles around internal linking tipper and also centralization and decentralization of site structures. Um, so, it makes sense. Um, yeah. So, a question just came in from um, a lady, Petola. Um Yeah. Yeah, you happy for me to jump into that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it, it, so the, the question is, does um, is this the same strategy that you would use for service businesses too? Um, absolutely. So, depending on your service, you basically want to answer questions up front. So, <clears throat> let's use a HVAC uh, maintenance, for example. Generally speaking, if people want to engage with a service, it's because they don't have the expertise or knowledge to perform the action themselves. So they want, they'll have concerns, they'll have questions, they'll have done some research online potentially to find out what they want, but mm -hmm. it's still bridging that gap. So the concept, I would look around this, and I've got an article of this on my site, is around user experience forecasting. So it's how can you help bridge that gap between the knowledge gap so that when people engage with your services they're slightly more educated they understand the value proposition more and they understand the value more and they have that trust yeah great and there's another question as well that's come in with me from mila and she's asking how can we get creative around the creation of the landing pages with um gated downloadable resources yeah um I remember me from the panel yesterday who asked a few good questions as well. Um, so, with gated resources, there's always a value proposition deficit there because you're requiring the user to take an additional action. And if the information is already freely available on the internet, you've got to determine whether or not you should also make that freely available. Having gated resources that build on the information already freely available, verifiable, verified by cohorts, and then you produce as well, and adding it as a second stage, maybe is brochure level or more specific to your own product services. That's the approach I would take there. Whereas if you're just going to take this large hub or even like white paper it, we need to understand what, the, for me, the difference is between the value for white paper brings, because we know the white paper will get the email, it will get the telephone number, it will create a potential lead for sales to follow up, but you need to add an extra value proposition for someone to do to download that, and if it's just going to reiterate what's already out there on the internet, there is no value proposition, and it's just a turn off from someone actually wanting to engage in that initial instance. So I'd use the hubs, build that trust element first, and then once you've got the trust element, then at the end of them say, oh, to find out how this can be more specific to, I don't know, using my hiking boots, for example, um, if you want our in-depth guide on hiking through and the Canadian outback in minus 37 Fahrenheit or something like that, 
then that's an added value proposition and personalised tailored to what necessarily isn't available on the internet. Great, thanks for thanks for the answer. Well, actually, that just wraps us up to exactly the end of the the talk at zero point zero zero. Um, so everyone, I hope you can um, also just join me in thanking Dan for um, for for going through a very detailed um, presentation there. That um that that also just to, I keep reminding people you can download these PDFs. You can message Dan in the um in the Pine tool if you have any other questions and see him on uh, like he said Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and uh, and also his website. So do make sure you you look for those links. And especially while people are still at conference, you know everyone's uh, really active, sharing information. Now's the kind of time to do that. Um, but cool. Well, so we'll leave it there. Thank you, Dan. And uh, see you around at the rest of the conference. No, thank you, Hamil, and thank you, everyone, for sticking with me. Cheers. The stream ending countdown. Yeah, I just stay very still during that because I don't.